So thanks for joining us. Today we're going to run over a really comprehensive guide of building a race-built 13B rotary engine from start to finish, including all the machining steps as well as final assembly. So come join us now. I'm going to take pity on this poor little keg here and uh, pull it out. We picked up a few things that we want to look at, give some more attention to. So that rear plate's got a little nick on it. We want to step up this engine. We want to go to a semi-PP. So we're going to get some new housings and we'll give it the semi-PP treatment. So stand by for Project Redline 2.0. So we've obviously got everything laid out here, but before we get to this step to building the engine, there's a lot of steps that go on before that. So such as uh, machining these rotors and the assembly of the rotors, prepping, porting, and uh, painting of all the engine components here, measuring the journals and the crank, as well as uh, inside the rotors and the stationary gears. We've got to set, make sure we set top dead center timing. And then we've got a whole heap of tools here, which you may or may not have seen before. So what we're going to do is, first of all, before we get building the engine, run over some of these tools that we use and how we get to the point right here. Um, so if you want to do it at home, you'll be able to. There's a lot of machinery, a lot of expensive machinery that I use here, which is why a lot of people take these engines to professionals to get built. But we're going to show you how we do it here. And let's take a final look at some of the stuff we've got on the bench right now. All right. so. One of the first things I do uh, before I start building an engine is uh, using this tool here, which is a top dent setter um, check fixture. Uh, it's from Extreme Rotaries. And what it does is it, it locks the eccentric shaft uh, in place on the front iron, and then you can get your pulley, mount your pulley to the front, and with the timing cover, there's a, t there's a marking pointer for timing here. So what happens is, with the, with the shaft in the engine mounted, this will spin around here. And you can see I've already put a, a fair mark in there. I know because I've already used this tool that that mark right there is actually true top dead center for this engine. Now there's different pulleys and different marks. You can see, it's gonna be hard to see, but there's a mark there and another mark there. They're the factory marks. There's no guarantee that those marks are spot on for every engine whenever you're changing parts and that. So one of the biggest things with uh, rotors at timing is, you know, too little timing can lead to high EGTs and, and down on horsepower, too much timing could lead to, you know, the engine blowing up as well too. So timing is really, really critical rotor engine. So I use this always with every engine I build to properly dial in true top dead center. So I know when you go to tune the engine that everything is right there. So next part I move along to, especially when I'm disassembling engines and then reassembling is an inside and an outside micrometer. So what these do is this can go in here or in here and measures the, the ID of the bearing and that corresponds to the dimensions here. So the difference between uh, this dimension and say this dimension in here is your bearing clearance. Now that's important because in race engines, um, different depending on the grade of oil you're using, but also for clearance reasons, if you're running higher oil pressure, you may want a higher clearance here. So we measure these surfaces uh, corresponding with the bearings in the in the rotor and the stationary gear, and that will give us our overall bearing clearance. And when if we need to alter bearing clearances, there are different methods on getting those uh, numbers. You can either change uh, machine off. Uh, a bit off the eccentric shaft or you can get uh, better clearance uh, bearings as well so there's also a few other different ways of doing it we won't cover those off but next in tools is um, this one's essentially sort of uh, run out or, or face wear so what this does a dial indicator goes in here and you can actually measure on the on the surface of the face wear marks so what what you want is th there's obviously tolerance through Mazda that says what the face wear has to be and this this tool helps measure measure that. So it's another one. Um, this is one I use for measuring apex seal width. So obviously the apex seal fits in in here. Uh, and I'll just grab, uh, obviously the apex seal is already in general. I'll just grab an older one because uh, I do have one in here. But sometimes when you get apex seals, they're not always, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large process and it may not, they may not be exactly spot on. So if we use this tool here, um, you can see that fits in there perfectly. Oop, and I just dropped the corner piece. But that's um, that's how I measure that. And if they if it doesn't fit in there, then it's just a simple case of machining it on on something like this on a, on a block and getting it down to the right tolerance. So there's that. 
Um, we've got our water um, pressure tester system. So this bolts onto the front iron and uh, just a normal sort of trader valve here. We pump air pressure into about say 15 to 20 PSI. We leave it, leave it for half an hour, an hour, and we check for pressure drop. If there's no pressure drop, then it's good to go. Put it in the car, send it to the customer. If there is pressure drop, then well, you've got a problem and you have to chase it. So it could be water seals not sealing somewhere, or you've pinched one or an O-ring or something, or somewhere else is leaking on the system and just you don't need to find it. But that's a perfect one if you're going to give a customer an engine to make sure you do the simple checks before it goes out the door. Uh, we've got dial indicator here. So this is to check the end float of the engine. So the engine isn't just static in the car, that, or the eccentric shaft isn't static in the car. It, it obviously has some form of float. So um, this dial indicator measures that float in 0 0.01 of a millimeter increment. So we, we, we've got a um, tolerances from Mazda that we need to keep in spec. So we'll run over that later. And then of course, we've got standard tools such as um, we've got two different torque wrenches. So one for you know larger torque settings for 40, plus um, newton meters and this one's for the smaller bolts so the like the m6 sort of bolts and then we've got other stuff like gaskets and oil um, and a couple of different torque wrenches and some other hand tools as well so um, not to mention all this stuff we've also got a mill up here and just over here we've got a lathe now, these are two really expensive tools and this is the kind of stuff that um, a lot of people, if you are looking to do stuff yourself, you're probably going to have to send stuff, this stuff out to get done because these machines aren't cheap at all. So, um, but that's pretty much it for the machinery. Uh, let's take a closer look at how we can put all this into action and start uh, machining this engine so it's ready for assembly. So studying the engine, uh, it involves screwing studs in here that go all the way through the engine. So they'll go all the way through here and all the way through these plates and then come out the back here and then a stud and clamps just clamps that whole engine up together. So what we need to do is drill a hole all the way through that, 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 that's, that's half inch uh, diameter and to and it needs to be perfectly spot on. So obviously we're drilling a half inch hole and it's a half inch stud the tolerances are really, really, really tight. If you've got, you know, the guys with CNCs and that will do it easily. They press a button on the machine and it gets done. But how can you do it at home with, say, a drill press? Or in my case, I've got a mill. Uh, the mill makes it a bit easier in a drill press, but you can still do it. Um, what I do is my two tools, essentially, or most of the tools are this. So the thread in here is M10 by 1.0. Uh, it's very very fine thread uh, so I've got what I've got here is a tap and, and what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to move the machine head down into position so this isn't bolted on now it's not clamping in place so you can see it's actually it moved the plate over to where it wants to be what's happening is that's threaded in there and it's, so it's picking up the plate so I know that that is perfectly locked on in that thread uh, and what that means is that it's now this whole column is completely centered on that hole. Tighten this down to, uh, uh, that's fine. You can see now it's not moving. It's actually, I always have the collar in there really loose and as you can see there, it's trying to pull the collar out. So uh, all I'm gonna do now is just unthread it. I've pretty much drilled all the holes. So all, all you'll see me doing is the final reaming process now. So I will run this through, but You'll see we stack up this sandwich basically here now, one, two, three, four, uh, five all the way up to the top, and we'll run the reamer through each one. So we'll run through that now. Just before we get started, it's September here in Melbourne, and I know it's sometimes cold down here, but look at that. What a joke. It feels like 0 0.9, feels every bit of that too. Uh, it's tough life out here in the garage sometimes. Okay, so what the reamer is going to do is start that hole there and give it a nice true round hole for the uh, drill bit to go all the way through. So let's uh, let's start that. You can see there's no deflection in the bit at all. There's no reason to go 
harder, faster, just end up creating too much heat, and heat just ruins all your expensive tools. So this is ultra boring. So we'll catch you at the uh, at the end of this, I think. So the next step we're going to look at here is the rotors. So when it comes to racing type uh, engine preparation, we want to clearance certain areas. So you would have seen on our previous the rebuild, uh, it had some race clearancing done. So just to explain what we're going to do here is pretty much off the entire surface of this face, we're going to remove a, a very, very small amount. Then in the corners of the tips here, we're going to remove another certain small amount again. Um, across this edge here, we're going to uh, remove a certain amount across the face here. In between this combustion chamber pocket, we're going to re remove a certain amount and also across uh, the the top of the apex seal uh, tip of the rotor, we're going to remove a, a small amount as well. And the, the reason for that is at extreme high RPM, uh, these areas are prone to contacting uh, the, the housing surface or even the rotor surface. So it's going to be really, really hard to, to pick up on camera. But um, <clears throat> like I said, this was the stock engine out of my uh, FD. Uh, and that engine was just, I mean, it was a, <clears throat> a turbo bridge port. This engine was built by another workshop that I, when I bought the car, it was already sort of done, uh, the secondary bridge port and that. So, um, but everything else in it was stock. So this engine was exactly, was stock except for that one. Remember where we stripped it down, had that one down in the rear um, going through the entire engine, but that was it. I mean, it was basically standard other than that. So there was no machine work. Uh, there was no real other porting work on the housings or anything, just the little secondary bridge. Uh, but yeah, no no race clearancing or machining in that. And you can just see here, you can see what looks like a light light machining marks. And that's more than likely because that surface has be, has come in contact uh, with the housings perhaps, uh, the, the, the plate, sorry. Uh, because it's the only it's the only sort of wear mark I can see all, all across uh, the face. So these engines obviously designed to rev. You know, they really don't like revving to nine and a half thousand RPM and then banging off the rev limiter, which I did a few times in this thing. So a bit of clearancing, we'll sort that out. And that's what we're gonna do uh, now today. Okay, so we've got to set up in the lathe here. What I'm doing now is just got a dial indicator on the face. I just want to make sure what the run out is. So it's pretty, it's basically better than uh, 0.01 of a millimeter. So uh, that is exactly squared up in there. So that's great. So next step is this tool here, which is like a carbide cutter. Um, we can bring this hole, use the handle, bring it in. So this will spin around and then um, we can take a certain amount off the face. So let's do some of that now. We go nice machine surface so we'll continue that and um, <clears throat> we'll take another little bit off here as well now so important part of uh, any build when you're machining anything is to make sure it all goes together properly before you build it you don't want to find out you've got a problem or really tight clearance or something doesn't go together after you're halfway through building the engine because you're almost at the point of no return there and you're in some real trouble so have a look here and you can see we've got all the studs uh, we doweled, we left this one as, as doweled because uh, that's how it was already. It was already doweled there, so we just re-drilled the, the housings for the, to, to, hit, to fit the dowel. But all these studs now are bottomed out. They're going perfectly, so at least we know that's done. Uh, next part, as you can see, it's obviously filthy. Um, next part is to give it a bath, and then we'll paint it. So next part is paint. Um, not really fast that much about paint and paint schemes some people are really really particular when it comes to what color their engine is um, they spend more time to, talking about how they want it painted than anything else um, and fantastic if, if that's what um, floats your boat no problems uh, a lot of people build a lot of very nice cars that obviously are color schemes and things like that no problems i'm more than likely going to paint this thing black a helper here uh -oh. all right what are you going to use to clean it then i'm going to do it all right How are we doing? Yeah, like this. Oh, how do we do this? Yeah. They're obviously aluminium. 
These are steel, and there's machine liners and stuff here too. So the faces of these, and also the irons and that, if once you use a chemical to clean them off, uh, and they're completely, um, I mean these ones have still got a little bit of residual paint on them, but if these were flat irons and brand new, what you'll see is you can almost see here, a little bit of surface rust starts straight away. So always pr spray the, the face surface of the plates with um, some form of anti-corrosion uh, inhibitor. Uh, even, I mean, the rust can start just from the atmosphere, the water in the atmosphere. So, um, just because they're dry, doesn't mean they won't rust if they're completely naked and bare uh, surfaces. So, um, little tip: just uh, spray. I always spray all the oiling and bearing sort of surfaces to the oil passages, so there's no rust uh, possible getting in there either. Even coats. Same. Just gun it on. Get some colour on there. So obviously one of the last parts before building the engine means making sure that all the uh, little seals and whatnot are right mic'd up to spec and all the, all, all the tolerances are correct. Side seals are one of the things that will need to be machined uh, to length quite a lot because they do come, uh, the power seal ones, uh, an oversize. So you can make them fit so you can do your own, own spec uh, tolerance the way you want it. This is the rig that I use to, to do that. Uh, it's very simple. Let's get a side seal in here, and it just, it just gets fed in there, machines away, and bring it out, and it just machines that, are, machines that away there to the right tolerance. We then put it in the rotor, uh, one of the good rotors, it's just sitting under here now. This mic gauge, woo, can you see that? Two thou. So use that, and once that can actually finally pass through the gap, then we're good to go and we've got to do that 12 times. So we've got to do that to all these side seals here. Once that's done, I'll uh, move on to other stuff like measuring the bearing tolerances, uh, housing width, apex seal width and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, that'll be about it. Then it's finally time to assemble. Okay, so it's pre-assembly time, which means we're gonna put those O-rings in those cases, put those springs in these rotors and also assemble all this stuff here. So these have been individually machined to the exact tolerances here. So you can see here says three rear. Here we've got rear three and rear three, the G means gear side. So I know that this exact side, so this one right here goes right there because every, every single groove may be just slightly different. So you've got to do this, otherwise, you know, Tight, tight tolerances. I mean, you know, two thousand is difference between two thousand and five thousand can mean you know quite a fair few compression points. So, got to get it all spot on. This is how I do it. Set it all out, and time to assemble basically everything there. So, time to get the massive tub of Vaso. So, after oil control uh, O rings are installed, there it's time to install the springs first. Uh, you may or may not have color paint on. Uh, your oil controlling springs so you may have white and black if you do have white and black uh, white and black sorry if you may have white and blue uh, if you have white and blue uh, and then new springs it makes it a bit easy to install white goes to the front of the rotor so not the gear side um, the front so this is the front rotor so this makes this the front of the rotor this is the rear rotor this is the front of the rear rotor okay so the engines rotating uh, this way so it's very important that these springs are installed in the right on the correct side because if not the spring won't be able to seat in a little groove so just give you a bit tough to see this there's a little divot right here if you don't have any um any paint at all on, on the spring it's it's pretty easy in the end to find out uh what size what side these go in because if we drop that spring in there we can try and drag it around now if you imagine the rotors are uh, rotating this way, the seal is actually trying to pull on it the other way, putting on force, and you see it doesn't move in that groove. Now if I put the wrong seal in here, which I will now, which is one of these ones, if we can get it out of the pan, here we go, uh, and we do the same force, you see it spins, which will mean they won't seal properly 
and it's definitely no good. So definitely get that right. Uh, easy, easy, easy one for people who don't have any experience with rotaries uh, to get it wrong. Uh, but yeah, if, if the springs have the blue and the white paint, I'd definitely try and get those ones if this is something you haven't done before because you, you can't make a mistake then. The front of the front rotor, front of the rear rotor, white. Rear of the front rotor, rear of the rear rotor, blue. Time to throw these in here now. Okay, building an engine with one hand. Oh, this shit ain't easy. This inner spring is much easier to get in than the outer, uh, generally, so I'll be putting the camera down now and uh, putting that rear in with two hands. So next is making all of this here disappear into these two things here. So first things what I'll do is corner seals and side seals and apex seals, flip it over, do corner seals, uh, side seals again. Um, and then basically glue all this in with Vaseline so it holds in place. And then I'll do the same thing with the rear rotor. Yeah, when we drop them in, the only thing that won't go in here are the apex seal springs. So they don't go in until you install them in the engine. Because obviously if these were in here, the apex seals would just spring straight out of there. So we'll install all of this except for this here right now. I don't have a GoPro mounted to my head or anything. I'm literally holding the camera with uh, one hand while I'm trying to do this, so wish me luck. I can tell you right now, it's bloody easy. Also, you can see here that it looks like it's two parts there. That's because it is. Uh, when the engine, as soon as the engine basically turns over, this part will snap off from here. Uh, what I'm gonna do is install it this way. So I want the little piece that snaps off uh, down the end facing up, essentially when I install it, just in case it does break off because if it breaks off and it's down on this, and remember this is the front plate here, because it's the front of the engine, um, it's gonna be very hard to recover that without lifting out the whole rotor. So what I'm gonna do is just install that here now. Like so. Okay, corner seals, side seals, oil control rings, steels, and apex seals are in. Our next step is, quite honestly, to Vaseline the living Christ out of everything so it doesn't move. So. Into the tub we go. Get it in there. There we go. Now, this isn't so much for initial startup lubrication. It is more to, if anything, to glue the parts in place so they don't fall out when I tip the rotor upside down. Because obviously, you've done one side here, but I still need to do uh, the other side. And if you don't want 800 gallons of Vaseline in, in your engine on start, then I mean, it's easy, just as just before you install the rotors, if you want to just remove some of this, go for it. But whatever, it's just, um, I mean, it's petroleum jelly, Vaseline by its um, trade name, but yeah, petroleum jelly, petroleum based sort of oil products, so it just burns off, no dramas. Leaving it in all here, you just get a bit of a smoke show, you know, all gets hot, melts, goes in the oil, do an oil change, all comes out, it's fine. Okay, so if you're at this point, this bench should look like this. If there is any other seals or springs left over, guess what? Uh-oh, time to pull those apart and double check everything. Yeah, apex seal springs have all you should be left. We're pretty much at the point now where it's time to assemble the engine now. Only thing I haven't run over is rotor weight uh, and bearing clearances. Uh, I've written the bearing clearances just here for you. You can work out your own bearing clearances. That stuff's readily available all over the internet. We ran over it a bit in our original rebuild video too. So this race engine's a little bit different, tiny bit different than that, but not much different. But hey, everyone's got to have some kind of secret here and there. But the yeah, rotors have all been weighed. Everything's been mic'd up and checked up. So all good to go. So next step is, bang, whacking it on that engine stand there and starting to assemble it. So before we start uh, assembly, you notice that there's no O-rings here, and that's these. So we've got an inner and outer, and we'll again have to hit the Vaseline tub, throw them in. The Vaseline again just helps keep it in place. Some people use other products, but I've used Vaseline always and never had an issue with it. So get those in now, and uh, we can start assembling what's under the curtain here. But uh, first, off we go to the Vaso tub. 
So all the really hard work is done. Building the engine is actually the easy part. You can almost think of it this, building an engine is like a Big Mac. You got a piece of bread, meat, bread, meat, bread. It's just, it's just five plates and housings going together. And when you've assembled everything already, it's just a case of putting all those together. So if you know how to put stuff down and, and the little intricacies of putting the apex seal springs in, this process is really, really straightforward and really simple. So the stuff before was hard. This is the easy stuff, but enough talking, let's get building. So we've got our engine stand set up. It's all bolted here. Um, this is a bit of a homemade one because the ones that you buy off the shelf won't suit rotaries. I do have another one from Pineapple Racing or someone over there. It's a proper one that I will get. I'm just missing another headstock. I don't know where I've put it. So I start with the front plate. And what we've got here is the stationary gear installed because that's obviously got the bearing inside of it that will house, um, that will hold the uh, eccentric shaft when I put it in here. And then the rotor will locate on this gear. I've also got the inner and outer uh, water seals here all in. Uh, and there's a little bit of Vaseline on there you can see. And that's just so if I do this, they don't come out. All right, next step, what I do, everyone does this um, next step a little bit differently. Some people put the rotor on first and they put the housing on. Um, I've always put the housing on first myself. So before I do that, but uh, I just need to, th these, these legs here obviously, um, this is oil, so this is the oil pan. This, this leg here is where the oil pan bolts on, so oil can splash up here. If you don't have any sealant or anything here, there is a, there is a chance that oil can leak past there. So we'll just put a, a thin smear of RTV here. You don't need to go ultra serious or anything. It's not holding the engine together. It's just a, it's just a seal from a bit of, a bit of the oil, oil splash. So that's sort of step one, and I'll just paint it on nicely because I like to spread ITV all over my fingers and everything that I own. Donning the shorts today, mate. Fucking sun's out, guns out. Melbourne weather turning it on for once. I, I believe tomorrow will probably be just, you know, Melbourne perfect one day, terrible in the afternoon, perfect at evening and then terrible the next day. So shorts could be short lived, pardon the pun. Dow there, dow there. Another dow will go there, but I'll put that in place after I whack the housing down. Now we've assembled our O-rings here in the housing, one on either side, which seals around that O-ring surface as well. Is there a front and rear housing? I see that written a lot online. Yeah, th I mean these have stamped F and R, but um, not really. It, 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 you know, if you had a front rear housing or a rear housing, it won't really make too much of a difference. There might be some separate uh, earlier model motors that might have had a, a bit, um, a bit of a difference in like these missing or whatever. But no, for for the um, for the most part, it won't really matter if you. If you get an F or an R or whatever, um, I believe Project Redline originally had two rear housings on it. So uh, down we go and in place. So that's now in there. What I'll do is I'll get our other dowel and I'll just put that in there. Now these, these will be a bit of a tight fit because they're an interference fit that's meant to be tight. Uh, there we go. Now this one had to be um, drilled out to 16 mil to suit the dowel. All the other ones are drilled out to half inch. Uh, and the reason for that is this was already uh, drilled out to a dowel so that it was recessed in the center plate so that the factory through bolt um, is only so long. This actually uses a super long bolt called, um, which people in, in the industry traditionally call an M bolt because there's an M Mazda logo stamped on it. We'll see that later on. And because the thread had been, or the, the plate had been recessed here, the new the, um, power seal half inch stud kit won't sit in that hole properly. So if you've got a dowel engine and you're looking to run the bigger half inch studs, you probably won't be able to run them if you're using, um, if you're using these dowels. So next step is what I wanna do is uh, throw the rotor in. So there is no right way or wrong way or wrong location to put this in. Essentially, this is front, the gear is here, the gear is obviously there. So it's just a case of putting this down here. And it will just locate on the gear like that. So, so you can now we're now we need to, more importantly, we need to stop and take the thumbnail photo for this video. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. As you can see, it's sort of falling there. But yeah, once I put the uh, eccentric shaft in here, it will locate that in place and then that's fixed. So yeah, now it's time to get the uh, shaft in there. All right, so before I put the uh, shaft in the hole, uh -huh, um, I've got to lubricate the bearings. So th these are, aren't brand new bearings either because uh, rotaries aren't overall, over, overly hard on bearings anyway, but these, this is my race engine. 
primarily before it was just a, a standard sort of engine from the FD and it already had new bearings in it. So uh, if anything, they've worn in a little bit, which is even better, uh, slightly more clearance, which is great. And I'll just also pump a bit of oil on here. Time for this to go in here. And again, like I said before, this, what will happen is when I'm putting this in here, um, the shaft, if anything, will, will locate and dictate where everything has to go. And as you can see, bang, it just pops in. So what that's done is just put everything exactly where it needs to be. You don't have to worry about when you're putting the rotor in, if you're putting it up or down in the wrong way, uh, the, the shaft will dictate where that has to be. So, alrighty. Next part is, so when we assemble uh, the rotors, we put the apex seals in and that was to ensure that the corner seals don't move around because if you get a corner seal that moves or the spring at the bottom of the rotor, the only way to recover that is take the eccentric shaft out, take the rotor out again and fix it. So what we'll do now is take the corner seals out and we'll pop the apex seal up and then we'll assemble the apex seal springs. All right, now this can be done with a, a magnet or just a um, pair of now these are the power seal springy type corner seals. They don't require the factory style little rubbery things in them. So if you're looking and going, oh, you've forgotten the little rubbers. No, I haven't. They, uh, they're not required. So what I'll do now is, what I'll do now is just take the apex seal out in, with the same deal. They'll come out pretty easily because there's no tension on them. And now it's just a case of, of, of assembling the spring in here. So it's going to be hard to see there's a bit of Vaseline on it, but there's a step just here and there's another step up the top here. So there's two springs. So there's one spring that will sit on the inside of the apex seal and one on the outside of the apex seal. So those springs are here and they sit like so. So there's one on, on the outside and one on the inside. And now it's just a case of, of putting them where they need to be. So you start with the longer spring, it's just so it's got a bit of attention to hold the, the shorter spring in place. And we'll feed that one. So we've just uh, assembled the front rotor, apex seals in, corner seals in, everything's right. It rotates, which is definitely a good start. Always check that, that the engine still does at least a, a couple of rotations. Uh, oil the surfaces because, you know, come for a startup, uh, we want them to make sure it's fully protected. It means there'll be, uh, uh, you know, a, a bucket load of smoke, but big deal, um, whatever. You Better off having a bit of smoke at initial startup rather than uh, an engine with a score on it or something because it's got metal on metal contact. So, all right, next, um, next setup is putting the center plate on. So this is a bit of a, a juggling act. And this center plate, as you can see, it can't just fit over the hole nicely. What I have to do is lift this uh, shaft up with my knee underneath here. That's the easiest way to do it for a, a backyarder and, um, and try and wrestle this in here. So here we go. You be ultra careful with the bearing surfaces and whatnot as well. There we go. Don't trap your fingers in there either and try not to get all the uh, so you've done that first RTV. Day. First go, maybe I've done this before, who knows? Once or twice. So next step is obviously next housing, next rotor. So what you'll see is some of the um, Vaseline's really, really um, thin. Now in Melbourne, it's normally quite cool. Uh, the Vaseline's fine to use. However, if you're in a more temperate climate, you'll find this probably melts and won't hold the O-rings in place. So you can use something like rubber grease that'll hold its, uh, it'll hold its structure much better. Or a lot of people use Hylomar and things like that. So Vaseline's just easy, cheap, and it works. So it's why I normally use it. But day like today with a bit of heat, running into a bit of trouble. So, all right, time to move on to the next, uh, the next one. Only reason I'm putting this on with my finger here is because, you know. Where are those famous uh, rubber gloves, the internet ones? <laughs> That's true. I'm not using the rubber gloves today. I could use them. I've only got some crap ones at the moment. I really don't like them, so you have to get some more. Um, the only reason I put it over spread it over my finger is uh, it lets me know sort of how thick it is in all areas, but also you never know if you've just pulled your silicon off the shelf and there might be a little dry bit in it or something. So if you've got a hard dry bit there, it's not going to spread around. So it just ensures that it's all nice, new and fresh and it's um, laid at an even manner. Next step. Put this in again. All right, here we go. That's that, and now this one 
Go in, there we go. That's all in place, no pinched O-rings, it's great. Uh, now we drop the rotor in. So, same as before. This will be the gear side is up this time because the gear will be on, on the rear. So this is this face down. We'll just plonk it in now. And just like before as well, there is only one possible way that this can go on. So, you're just doing that, bit of back and forward and down it sits. You can see these sitting a bit proud. Go down bastards. Next step is exactly what we did on the front on the front rotor. It's just a case of taking out the um, these corner seals and then putting apex seal springs in there. Awesome Vaso, I can feel it. It is melting at a rapid rate. Might have to use the old Penrite rubber grease. Heading into summer now, or spring or whatever it is. I'm sure it'll be a different season tomorrow in Melbourne. This is the air, like an outer water seal. So the water runs through these jackets here to cool the engine. And the main thing for this uh, seal is to make sure that there's no twist in it. The most common thing would be that you would get a twist somewhere in the seal. Um, so it's important to chase a seal all the way in and then um, and all the way back. So these are, this is the, the power seals o-ring kit. So these are one piece. There's no join in them. If you are using a Mazda seal, you'll see there'll be like a, a green different area here because they're actually a join seal. You have to put that uh, join area just up here above the intake port. That's the coolest part of the engine. Uh, and that just protects that join from extra heat. You can see there's obviously a bit of seal overlapping. So all you do is you just sort of push back, push the seal, bunch it up a bit around, and then you'll find that it just drops into place so what I'm going to do now is put a bit of extra Vaseline on here because like I said it is hot um, worst outcome here is dropping the engine in place and um, the seal sort of falling out in place what will happen then is if you do pinch a seal you probably notice that depending on whereabouts it is if it's external you'll get a you'll get a water leak don't need to fit the stationary gear now but I'm going to anyway uh, this o-ring is, is this one, so there's an o-ring in here, um, on RX-8 engines it's actually in the back but this is an FD RX-7 engine, so all I'm going to do now is uh, attempt to fit that, I can't see, I'm going to put my head in front of the camera, too bad. It's just a case of lightly tapping this into, into place, just some light taps with a rubber mallet, you don't want to put bolts in and drive it into place. With that, that's definitely not the way to do it. Just give them some light tops with a rubber melt to get in place. And then I'll get our, I'll just whack a couple of these bolts in now. Get the right ones. Just to hold it in place for now. I'll worry about doing these up to torque up the spec in that uh, a bit later. Um, I'll set my uh, impact wrench to three ugga duggers. There we go. Torque the spec, definitely. There we go, bang. So maybe a tiny little bit of manoeuvre to make sure it meshes with the, that um, rear stationary gear meshes with the rear rotor, but once that's in, boom, it's in place. And what you wanna do now is sort of just visually inspect everything. So if you, you see on this side, uh, all the gaps here are even. You can see in, in these surfaces here where the oil can get out, there's some um, RTV poking through, so that's great. So next step is to put all these through bolts through. So as you can see, we machined all these holes. Um, what I'll do now is just for the sake of the video, I'll, I'll number all these in, for the torque sequence. And then we'll put all the, I'll, you'll come back then, all three bolts will be through and we'll torque them up. So next part of tying this big sandwich together are the through bolts. So we've got some here, we mentioned it before about that M bolt. So there's the, the Mazda logo M stamped on it. These ones are much longer. They're found in, in all rotary engines on the outside. Uh, but we'll be using this one for the dowel bolt as well. So we'll keep that one aside. So we'll use two of these M bolts, uh, but the rest of the bolts will actually be studs. So these are power seal half inch stud. They actually utilize a factory um, M10 by 1.0 uh, thread up here. So you don't need to um, have the block all machined and tapped out at the, at the front plate. 
but they're a much bigger half inch unit here with a, I think this is a UN, looks like a UNF um, thread up here, half inch UNF. So we'll put these in now. So what we've had to do is, as you saw, machine this block out. So what that then does is, is get pretty tight tolerance and they bottom out and then we have to do these up. So they'll do up and then once you see sort of the shoulder of the bolt disappear, um, it means it's pretty much torqued down into where it's got to be. The torque load isn't on the thread that's in the block. The torque load will be once the, once the bolt clamps the stud and pulls the stud up and everything in. So um, we just need to snug this in place. So the point of, of the, the shoulder of that um, stud there is below the line of that, and then we're good to go. So we've got to do that another well, 18 times or 17 times for the other 17 bolts here, and then we'll be ready to whack the nuts on and, and do that too. So normally um, what would happen is these bolts would have an o-ring so um, tension bolts have this little o-ring to seal it in place now because these factory um, tension o-rings tension bolt o-rings are only for this m10 um, threaded stud or bolt i should say this won't fit this so what we actually have to do is put rtv around here and then put the bolt on in place so it may look like you know a bit messy or a bit of a a backyard sort of operation because it's just using RTV but it works really well and, and you'd be surprised how many um, workshops actually run with that process so we'll get all this done now and then um, yeah we'll get on to that. Rattle guns over here so believe it or not I had this on before this one's got a a finger type mode so I put in the finger type mode and it'll, and it'll just click the um, it just clicks the bolts and the studs into essentially finger tight so then it's right to torque so that's really at a very very quick way um, very efficient way of getting all these bolts in place to now torque it so I'm going to do these a couple of steps so I'll set this to 40 newton meters at first because these obviously being half inch studs take a fair bit more than, than um, 40 so I'll just sort these out now and um, at 40 and and then we'll move around. So as you can see, they're numbered. We'll just go through that process now. What you'll find the first couple that you do, it really pulls the engine together. Um, I can probably get the old DeWalt gun out and finger tighten a fair bit more after this. So this was just in here temporarily to hold the stationary gear in place. So we'll move this now and start the assembly of the front of the engine. The last thing we do, um, before we put the front cover and all that on, we have to set the end float. So um, the amount that the eccentric shaft moves back and forward in this engine is called uh, the end float. And we set that um, using different spaces such as this one here. This one is, you can barely sort of read that, but it's got a D stamped stamp there. And there's all different letters which relate to a different thickness of the spacer, which relate to how it can move up and down. So it's really important when you are assembling the engine or when it's apart, that if you were to take this hub nut off, that hub nut puts the load against this whole assembly here. If you were to take that nut off, the load comes off and these Torrington bearings can drop down, move out of place. If that happens, you retorque your engine back, that's it, it's, it's done. Or this bearing will be ruined and you'll be taking the whole lot out again. So be very, very careful when you're doing that. Next is just to assemble the rest of this front stack, doesn't really matter what order it's all in because it's all coming apart again shortly. Alright, so we're just going to check the end float here. Uh, there's a couple of different size spaces you can put in to correct this. Uh, what we're looking for is 0.04 to 0.07 of a millimetre. Um, we'll check that now on here. So you can see the dial indicator currently right on zero. And if we put some light pressure and lift it up, you can see that's basically 0 0.045 of a millimetre, so that's correctly uh, within spec. So we can disassemble this front half now and then um, reassemble this with the oil pump and then put the timing cover on and then put the uh, front pulley back on. Got the pump all assembled in one piece, got the chain on and without the, the key in here, we'll just put this in place, drop it on in. And that's the easiest way to assemble the, uh, the oil pump. So there is slack and this isn't like a timing chain for a, uh, a V8 or something where, you know, that a little bit of slack there is, is totally unacceptable. It's, it's pretty normal to have a little bit of slack there. So just tighten these oil, oil pump bolts up now and uh, carry on.
All right, so that's it. Assembly part really easy, machinery part pretty detailed and difficult if you don't know what you're doing, but hopefully this video gives you a better idea of uh, what your engine builder, if you have the engine builder, goes through and why prices may be at the, where, where they're at because this is a lot of time invested in this engine bleeding up to the point we're building it. So the building part, as you can see, doesn't take that long. All the machinery part takes a long, long time. So it's all done now. Uh, next step is to put it in the car. So it hasn't got the oil pan on it yet. Last piece to go in is uh, this oil pressure reg. Uh, the best part is you can see here, there's nothing left over, which gives us a lot of confidence that everything's where it should be, which is right in there. I hope that was good for you guys. Hope you learned something. This isn't the only rotary video we've done. We've done a stack of rotary content on this channel. So uh, if you go back, we've done about what plate lapping is, whether you need a billet engine component or not, uh, the differences there. There's plenty on our project red line, uh, which is on the hoist just behind us here. Build up series and that from start to start to go. Uh, as well as all the different kinds of ports for rotary porting. So if you want to know some more about rotary stuff, just have a look at the rest of our channel. There's plenty there. Uh, but for now, whew, I've earned one of these. It's definitely time to knock off. I'll catch you next time. And like always, support the people who support us.